Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello one and all, welcome back again. Now we'll take forward another step to understanding more relevant aspects about diabetes mellitus. So far, if you recollect, we talked about diagnostic criteria, the glucose homeostasis, we talked about differences between type 1 and type 2 and the underlying pathogenesis. Now having known those facets, it is very important to understand what are the next problems in diabetes. We know how to diagnose it now, but how do you diagnose it? In the sense, how do you have an index of suspicion that a patient may be diabetic? Now, they usually come with a classical triad of symptoms as we understand them from literature, which is three P's as they call it, polyuria, polyphagia and polydipsia. Polyuria is of course increased frequency of urination, particularly problematic at nights. It's what the history of the patient will tell you. Polyphagia is a hunger. They will have constant hunger and they eat more frequently, but they tend to have weight loss. Now, that should arouse the suspicion of diabetes possibly. And polydipsia, increased thirst, okay, they keep drinking a lot of water, of course, then then to micturate a little more as well. So, these classical triad, the trifecta of P's is your symptomatology, symptomatology of diabetes mellitus. Now, that is more complex in the sense that when you have insulin deficiency, as you see a schematic representation on your screen, say, there will be insulin deficiency and or insulin resistance. Of course, we may be talking about type 1 and type 2 respectively there. Now, there will be leading, it leads to a decreased tissue glucose utilization that we have understood so far and it, the glucose tend to accumulate over in the over a period of time in your plasma which is called as hyperglycemia. Now, of course, they will not be utilized by the fat, neither muscle nor in the liver. So, what will happen as a downstream effect of that? You tend to get polyphagia mainly because the glucose levels are very high and may not be utilized over a period of time. So, you will have uh, increased lipolysis in the free fatty acids will be released and lipolysis can lead to polyphagia. In the muscle, there will be increased protein catabolism. That means it is broken down in the amino acids. So, protein is broken down in the place of glucose. Now, that catabolism can result to some amount of polyphagia. The patient has more hunger. <clears throat> in the liver, your glucagon is building up in excess. That is a counter regulatory hormone to insulin and increase in the level of glucagon has an opposite action over your glucose level where it tends to increase gluconeogenesis, more and more glucose will be produced. Now, but that won't be utilized there. You will have your ketone bodies being utilized. So, ketogenesis comes to play resulting in metabolic acidosis of ketone nature, what is called as ketoacidosis as well. Now, once that starts, it can result in a more acute metabolic complications like let us say diabetic ketoacidosis or it may lead to a chronic hyperglycemic state and this hyperglycemic state as we know as a glucose filters through your glomerulus into your tubules, it is very osmotically active. So, it will drag in water with them and the water will be excreted out in the urine resulting in what is called as polyuria. At the same time because of so much water is being depleted and lost in urination, you starve yourself of water resulting in a dehydration like state if you will resulting in what is called as increased thirst. So, all the receptors, osmoreceptors in your brain will tell you to quench your thirst by drinking more water. So, they will have polydipsia, so they consume more water. So, this cycle keeps on continuing that is how your three P's manifest and the patient comes to you as presentation. Now, what are some of the complications of diabetes mellitus? What can it lead to? Why is it such a big burden of disease in our community? Those are what are called as acute and chronic complications. Their behavioral patterns are slightly different. That is why we need to address them as these strict categories. Now, looking at acute complications, they tend to be more metabolic than other ways. For example, the poster child of acute complication of diabetes is what is called as DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Certainly seen more in type 1 than type 2, unheard of in type 2, but certainly reported in literature. Usually, the trigger for this apart from an absolute lack of insulin, maybe some other adjoining factors such as infections, okay, viral infections, sepsis can augur in such a reaction. Prolonged illnesses, exacerbation of illnesses can also do that. Trauma and acute antecedent trauma can also trigger a DKA like situation. So, it also has to do with a, almost like a flight or a fright response 
where the increase in amount of catecholamines like epinephrine will do the job of spiking the glucose levels. The patient usually comes with you with a severe sense of almost an uneasiness with anorexia, they will have vomiting tendencies and also a very nauseous feeling about it. And if you look at the respiratory rate that is very high, your respiratory rate increases a very deep respiration and a fast breathing pattern, what is called as Kussmaul's breathing and they will have a very fruity odour because of the ketone bodies, a very fruity odour in their breath. Of course, it gradually goes towards more mental, mental confabulations, they will have confusion, almost delirious and end up in a comatose situation. So, they will end up in a ICU generally because of these complications. Also, if you look at it, underlying them is an absolute lack of insulin, so deficiency causes a spike in the counter regulatory hormones such as glucagon. Both of this an excess glucagon and a lack of insulin. This a complete discrepancy results in what is called a severe hyperglycemia and severe hyperglycemia renders as we have understood in the chart earlier causes osmotic diuresis, lot of water will be excreted out in the kidney resulting in a relative dehydration like state and we know that that is problematic because then lot of these ketone bodies will be used up as metabolism for generating ATP or energy instead of glucose and this keto acidotic stage your pH starts to drop further resulting in metabolic acidosis and then ketone bodies also will be excreted out in the urine. Also if you look at it at the insulin deficiency itself, it also causes other stream effects such as an increase in the level of lipoprotein lipases because of deficiency of insulin. There is no checkpoint on that enzyme that of course causes esterification of free fatty acids in the liver resulting in a moiety called as fatty acyl coenzyme A which has been synthesized in excess. Now this is problematic because this gets oxidized within the mitochondria of your hepatocytes and the end product of that results in ketone bodies such as acetone, acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyric acid. All these three will increase in your plasma resulting in ketonemia and of course they will be filtered by your kidney and land up in the urine resulting in ketonuria. Of course you pick up them using specific tests in the urine such as Rotheras test. Another aspect of an acute metabolic complication is HHS. Remember we spoke about that in the context of type 2 diabetes mellitus called as hyperosmolar hyperosmotic syndrome. It was called as HONK earlier, and this is a new terminology given to it. Again, in the parlance of type 2, unheard of in type 1, so that is the distinction you need to draw there. The triggers for this is on similar lines as type 1, but here is generally due to lack of water intake, what is called as osmotic diuresis, okay, that underlines the pathology. The patients are usually of an older age group, 40 or above. And usually they will give you a history of stroke, pneumonia, infection, so on and so forth. So they have already been compromised the health in the context of the health. They have been jeopardized already and that is a past history that the patient will tell you. No ketonic symptoms, no small breathing, no fast shallow respiration. So that is why the patient goes under the radar. They do not present generally to your hospital well because those acute symptoms which force them to come to the hospital may not be present in HHS. But underlying factor still remains the same. They have chronic persistent hyperglycemia, very severe, much more so than your DKA. Here the levels of glucose may reach in the order somewhere around 800 to 1200 milligram per deciliter, whereas in diabetic ketoacidosis, you generally do not see them more than 600 milligram per deciliter. But then again, those are relatively speaking. Paradoxically though, another met acute metabolic complication can be hypoglycemia. You may ask, how hypoglycemia? How does it come about in a situation where it should be hyper? That is a delicious irony of complications in diabetes of course, because usually this will be following person missing their meals, okay. They will have missing meals or excess insulin administration. They will take more dosages of subcutaneous insulin than the normal, Your sugar levels will fall down very rapidly or a lot of phys physical exertion or exercise will drop down their um, blood sugar levels or glucose levels very specifically to a very low point, so resulting in hypoglycemia. So, they will come of course with a lot of the sympathetic uh, symptoms like dizziness, um, sweating, confabulations, confusions, uh, heart rate will be very high resulting in tachycardia. The patient can feel their heart rate is called as palpitation and that is how the patient is present. So, your acute complication can be summarized as diabetic ketoacidosis, HHS and hypoglycemia. This is schematic representation of an algorithm where you tend to see as a downstream effect of hypoglycemia as you can see. It results in glycosuria, glycosuria is osmotically active as we discussed earlier, so drags in water resulting in polyuria, so urine output will increase more frequently, more than 2 litres per day. 
polyurea has other problems such as it loses a lot of electrolytes, you lose a lot of sodium and potassium resulting in dehydration and also dehydration causes your osmoreceptors like I was talking about earlier to take more water to quench your thirst, so they will have polydipsia. Now of course glycosuria means that your glucose is not being utilized for burning calories, right? So they are using some other metabolism, maybe it is using ketones. One of the things that happens there is you tend to have hunger, so despite having frequent meals the hunger persists and you have weight loss resulting in polyphagia, weight loss and then of course your other macromolecules will be utilized in the place of glucose such as fat and protein resulting in a more acidotic state what is called as metabolic acidosis and the patient will have hypernia, okay, increased breathing of carbon dioxide. They also tend to have because of breakdown products of amino acids and protein a negative nitrogen balance and then eventually all this coalesce resulting in cumulative damage to the patient, the patient is very comatose and of course sometimes can be morbid as well resulting in mortality such as death. The chronic complication in contrast to acute complication you may want to study under the categories of macrovascular and microvascular. Macrovascular complications of course as we understand are large and medium sized muscular arterioles, generally those branches are affected and the template example we see them is atherosclerosis which is accelerated meaning the rate of atherogenesis is fastened under diabetes mellitus. So the patient will come with an acute MI, a heart attack, the patient may come with a stroke or what is called a cere cerebrovascular accident or the patient may come to you with a non-healing ulcer as we had seen in the top of the class in the earlier segment or maybe the patient will come to you with gangrene, complete blackening of the toes. So these are all macrovascular complications of diabetes mellitus. In contrast when you talk about microvascular we are talking small arterioles okay, and generally you see them in organs such as uh, the eye, particularly the retina, the kidney of course in the terms of the glomerular uh, apparatus there and of course the vasa nervosa in the peripheral nerves. This is schematic representation where you can see there is changes from head to toe everywhere is affected. You can see at the top of the screen of the head you can result in what is called as microangiopathy, small vessels which are very leaky and more vulnerable to get damaged in case of diabetes mellitus resulting in hemorrhages or what is called as stroke there. In the eye it can result in retinopathy, we will come to all these details in a bit, it is just a representation of the same. It can affect the heart, it can affect let us say amyloid deposition in the pancreas, in the hands it can cause neuropathy, both sensory motor, in the bladder it can cause autonomic neuropathy, in the legs it can cause gangrene. So you can see it is a complete picture where any part of the body can be involved, some more than the others of course where diabetes is concerned. So how does this complication come about? Something that is as simple as hyperglycemia, metabolic complications fair enough. What happens to each of these tissues, particularly the vessels? So what is underlying the pathogenesis of complications of diabetes mellitus? Now research tells us that there are three important sentinel events which are occurring in terms of complication diabetes mellitus. Number one, what is called as AGE, advanced glycated end products, okay, the AGE products tend to increase, we will discuss what those are in a bit. Activation of protein kinase C, it is an important event as well and the third one is what is called as disturbances in polyol pathway because of intracellular hyperglycemia. Now where formation of advanced glycated end products AGE is concerned, it is nothing but non-enzymatic glycosylation. That means when your glucose levels are very high, they tend to bind to protein moieties SH group of the proteins in almost a reversible manner. So it attaches to free amino acid groups of the proteins and becomes what is called as a glycosylated product because of non-enzymatic glycosylation, particularly collagen in your blood vessel walls. So that tends to show a lot of chemical derangement such as they tend to accumulate over a period of time within the tunicae of your blood vessels. Now these have other problems such as it can cause increase in cytokine release there that can damage your tissue such as tunica, a lot of procoagulant molecules can be liberated there as well which can augur a lot of thrombotic tendencies as well. It can trap proteins for example LDL, low density lipoproteins, one of your lousy cholesterols, okay. It, traps it within the tunica and retards its egress from the wall. So it, lipoproteins tend to accumulate, cholesterol that is what we are talking about, tends to accumulate, the bad cholesterol accumulates in the wall of your blood vessels over a period of time and it accelerates what is called as atherosclerotic plaques making you more vulnerable for stroke. Albumin, okay, the largest proteins in the body which are circulating the plasma certainly, so albumin is trapped mainly they bind to the glycated basement membrane 
the base membrane where the collagen is there, the lot of these albumin will be bound to that, particularly in areas where they have to navigate through very small areas such as your glomerular capillaries. Once that happens, you cause what is called as basement membrane thickening. Now, base membrane thickening is the earliest feature of diabetic nephropathy and what is called as glomerulopathy even and this is the most telltale feature that the patient has diabetes on a biopsy. The second event in the complication is activation of protein kinase C. Now, we know that when there is increased amount of glucose within the cell, it can stimulate the de novo synthesis of an intermediate product as DAG from your glycolytic intermediates. Now, this causes activation of protein kinase C. Because of this, there will be more pro-angiogenic products, vascular endothelial growth factor. Now, we know that it can bring about new blood vessels, particularly in the retina, it causes what is called as diabetic retinopathy pro-fibrogenic molecules such as transforming growth factor beta that also is activated by a protein kinase C which is actually a secondary messenger mechanism. So, there will be a lot of basement membrane material depositor and extracellular matrix thickening causing some sclerosis within your glomeruli and then production of pro-inflammatory cytokines within the endothelium of your vessels. The third prong of the complications in diabetes mellitus is intracellular hyperglycemia with disturbance in polyol pathway, we know that certain molecules do not require active receptors or insulin for glucose to enter into the cell. For example, they may be your nerves, the lens in the eye, the kidney of course and blood vessels where glucose just can enter, insulin can enter directly into this and glucose uptake can happen. Now, there is an increased amount of hyperglycemia within the cells because of lack of insulin results in increased amount of intracellular glucose. There is an enzyme called aldose reductase which comes into play. Now, aldose reductase converts all this into what is called as a sorbitol. Sorbitol is nothing but a polyol and eventually over a period of time under the aid of NADPH which gets converted to NADP, if you remember your metabolism and HMP shunt pathway, polyol or such as sorbitol will get converted to fructose, a monosaccharide. Another event that happens here at the far end of your screen you can see is a reduced level of GSH, glutathione levels, your glutathione levels tend to go down and we know that it is an important antioxidant. So, when your GSH levels are very down, you are prone to lot of inflammation and reactive oxygen species mediated damage, if you remember the chapter on cell injury. Now, all this fructose of course, again it is osmotically heavy, it drags in lot of water. So, intracellular osmolality increases and water influx. So, this you can remember in cataract, what happens in diabetics? The patients come with cataract for the same reason where increased level of fructose brings in a lot of water, the osmolarity increase and retains water within your lenses resulting in opacity of the eyesight. Now, finally, it can lead to other downstream effects such as cell injury and oxidative stress. Macrovascular co complications can occur such as coronary artery disease, renal vascular insufficiency and stroke. Okay, so, most of it has to do as we have understood in the last 5 slides or so with dyslipidemia. So, you may have certain preferentially under the action of absolute lack of insulin or relative lack of it and a hyperglycemic state, you have selective uh, atherogenic lipoproteins being elaborated a little more by the liver than usual. So, this such a preferential treatment results in lousy cholesterol building up resulting in more chance for them like I said to deposit within the vessel walls and result in stroke. Also, the levels of plasminogen activator inhibitors PAI1 will also will be elevated. So, that almost acts like a pro-coagulant which again potentiates your thrombogenic potential in diabetes mellitus. Diabetic nephropathy, okay, the well celebrated feature of nephropathy has to do with the starting event which is microalbuminuria. Now, this is quantitated as more than 30 milligrams of albumin but less than 300 milligrams per day. Somewhere in the range of that you call it microalbuminuria. Now, this has a direct effect because it is an independent risk factor for further complications such as stroke. Over a period of time, we are talking 10 to 15 years, this micro becomes macro. The micro is not detected, so they go under the radar and they will become micro to a macro resulting in more than 300 milligrams per day. You tend to see more of overt symptoms and eventually in 20 years, 25 years, all of these diabetic undergo what is called as ESRD or CKD5, end stage renal disease where the kidney is no longer viable and you may want to resort to either hemodialysis or may go for a transplant. The third of this uh, macrovascular complications is what is called as retinopathy. As we said earlier, 
you tend to see them as 60 to 80 percent of all the patients over 20 years, they will have increase in level of pro-angiogenic molecules like VEGF which causes neovascularization. New blood vessels like tentacles will up in your macula of your retina obstructing your vision. Cataract we have spoken about earlier in the context of the polyol pathway where there is increased osmolarity in water retention. Of course, glaucoma increase in the pressure within the eyeballs between anterior and posterior chamber because of the canal of Schlem being occluded, you will get a lot of water retained within the eyeballs resulting in very tense eyeball and absolutely lack of vision. For the next one which is a neuropathy which is again sometimes you do not discover it as much but the patient will come to you saying he has glove and stocking sensation that means both the upper limbs and lower limbs at the extremities they will have tingling and numbing sensation what we call as paresthesias. It is pertinent to know that neuropathy affects both the central and peripheral nervous system although the peripheral nervous systems are better recorded because the patient will present with such. So, it tends to be distal as said earlier, symmetric that means involves both parts of the body and polyneuropathy so more than one nerve is involved at a time. So, they get what is called as, as alluded to earlier glove and stocking type of neuropathy. So, both motor and sensory functions are affected mind you and over a period of time it can be even your autonomic neuropathy meaning certain organs like uh, the bowel and bladder you do not have any control over them. So, they tend to get affected erectile dysfunction okay, that also over a period of time is a complication associated with neuropathy in diabetes. Sometimes they come with only one feature such as a mononeuropathy they will have what is called as a wrist drop because of lack of uh, tone within the muscles there or a foot drop okay, while walking the feet buckles okay, that is the history the patient tells you. These are features of mononeuropathy again coming under the umbrella of neuropathy of diabetes. Apart from this the trifecta such as retinopathy, nephropathy and neuropathy as discussed earlier, they may have very trivial problems such as skin infections very common diabetes they say the wound does not heal in diabetics ok that is got to do with a lot of with this situations where your bacterial infections take over they can present with granuloma annulare, they can present with lipodica bacterium. So, they can come with tuberculosis ok when we are talking about reduced immunity it does, does not mean HIV or AIDS it means that diabetes has lowered your immunity as well. So, the patient is vulnerable to pick up opportunistic infections in India certainly tuberculosis comes there. Infection of the ascending tract of your urinary tract uh, resulting in what is called a spilonephritis acute inflammation of the renal pelvic elicial system that also is possible. So, this has to mainly do with uh, dysfunction of the neutrophils so you cannot drain in the infectious agents. You have increased vascular endothelial uh, vascularity being increased so they adhere more there and certainly the impaired cytokine release by the macrophages these underlie the mechanism for infections. In pregnancy we spoke about a bit about gestational diabetes mellitus. In pregnancy you have what is called as preeclampsic toxemia now that is for a longer discussion that where the patient presents with hypertension they tend to have lot of sugar in the urine ok. So, they are diagnosed as such. When they deliver babies they tend to be what is called as macrosomic or large for date babies that is a complication of course, child inherits the additional problem of neonatal hypoglycemia because the child's islet cells were doing the job for responding to the mother's hyperglycemia. So, they are burnt out completely by the time the child is born. So, the child also will be lacking insulin. So, this is the reputation what we have seen earlier just for completion you also have problems such as pyelonephritis, you will also have problems such as glomerulosclerosis which we will address in few slides. Apart from this what we have not discussed is peripheral vascular complications, glove and stingling of course, sensation and autonomic dysfunction as shown there the bladder is affected. Now, the last part of this is how are the organs involved, how do the organs look like when you are talking about diabetes, is a biopsy indicated possibly in the context of kidney disease because you want to stage it. So, in the kidney you will see the initial ones you can see is what is called as a diffuse thickening of the glomerular capillary based membrane. This is an image where past stain is used you can see there are shadows of pink there. So, your base membrane thickening is a first highlighted feature best demonstrated on electron microscopy but under light microscopy you can use cytochemical stains to accentuate the same. As it progresses over a period of time you will see a more nodular that means small nodules tend to deposit in and around the periphery of the glomerulus what are called as Kimmel steel Wilson lesions KW lesions what are called nodular glomerular sclerosis. These are pass positive lesions which look very similar to amyloid it is a differential diagnosis there. But over a period of time this nodular one will coalesce and become more diffuse. Generally seen best demonstrated at the periphery of the glomerula with a pass stain and sometimes will increase over the loops of the capillary resulting in what is called as fibrin caps. 
sometimes adhere into the Bowman's membrane resulting in what is called as capsular drops. And if you see the vessels in the interstitium, you will see myointimal hyperplasia and hyaline arteriosclerosis. So, a hypertension like state may also coexist or maybe the age products have trapped all these proteins within the vessel resulting in hyalinosis of the uh, lining tunicae. Of course, in kidney you can pick up pyelonephritis where you will see a lot of neutrophils forming microabscesses with the cortical scarring and tubular atrophy. What about pancreas? Okay, the lesser of this pancreatic biopsy is not indicated generally, but when you do, you will see a reduction in number of islets of pancreas with a lot of leukocytic infiltrates, particularly lymphocytes forming aggregates and plasma cells because we know there is an autoimmune component to the same. The amount of islet cell mass reduces, so the amount which is available for generating insulin is brought down. And over a period of time, you will see this extracellular proteinaceous, very uh, hyalinized uh, substance get deposited there. As you can see on the image, H and &E image there, the pink amorphous structure is called amyloid. They tend to deposit over the pancreas. So that brings us to the end of diabetes. So we discussed at length all the facets of this. And this last segment, we talked about the complications. We discussed the pathogenesis of the complications. We discussed acute and chronic metabolic complications. And we delved into each one of those macrovascular components, trying to understand how they are brought about, how does the organ look like, and eventually what is the end result. So I hope you had a good time understanding about diabetes in detail. Okay, have a good day. And thank you very much for your time.